Amen. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have music that has a message that prepares our hearts for the Word of God. And what a message in that song. I hope you were listening and worshiping in your heart. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 21. In just a few moments, Mark chapter 1 and verse 21. The title of the message today is, When the Devil Went to Church. When the Devil Went to Church. As you know, we went to Israel a few weeks ago, and uh, this is one of my favorite pictures as it uh, is taken from uh, Mount Arbel overlooking uh, the uh, towns of Magdala, Tagba, and Capernaum is seen there in the distance, or Capernaum. There's about three different ways to pronounce it. I may say one or the other. But what I'd like to share with you uh, this morning is just a brief glimpse of uh, where we went uh, as far as uh, uh, the picture you see there is Mount Arbel. Uh, that's in black. Uh, that was the mountain where the picture was taken. Uh, Magdala, we've talked about that. And then Tagba. And then we're on our way to uh, Capernaum. But we stayed in Tiberias. As you can see, uh, the picture there has Tiberias down at the bottom. So I just wanted to give you a brief picture of the hills of Galilee. So this is uh, looking out our motel window. Uh, there's a picture of that motel on the back on the table there. Uh, and I put a little uh, place there where uh, the one we stayed in. Uh, this is panning with my uh, camera to the left, looking at the Sea of Galilee. And then what I did is I panned to the right. And I wanted you to see the hills of Judea. So this is coming down uh, as I, the Sea of Galilee, of course, on the left. So I just turned around to the right, and there's uh, the hills of uh, Galilee of Tiberias. Now, Tiberias uh, was an area that uh, where the Romans, the Greeks, and the Jews all congregated in that particular town. Tiberias was built by Herod Antipas and named after, of course, uh, Tiberias. No strict Jew would go to Tiberias because it was a Roman city and it was built on top of a cemetery. There is no record in the scripture of Jesus ever going to Tiberias. Now it's not to say he didn't go there, but uh, there's no record in the scripture uh, whatsoever that Jesus went uh, to Tiberias. So again, my wife says, no, those aren't hills, those are mountains. So, but anyway, you can see uh, that the mountains are the hills of Judea. So, as we see in this picture, uh, we did exactly what verse 21 says. And they went into Capernaum. Now, as you see on the sign, you may not can see it from the back, and that picture is a little bit dark, but uh, it says uh, on the sign there, uh, Capernaum. Capernaum, which uh, is two words in the uh, Hebrew. It means the village of Nahum. Or Nahum is what it says. So we went to that city. So look in verse 21. And they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So again, as we went into this particular village, it was interesting to look back from this viewpoint and see the very, um, could we say, the synagogue that was built. Um, and let me say that we're looking from, which we'll come to a little bit later uh, in our story, maybe next week, we're looking from the home of Peter. They uncovered the home of Peter. 
that they believe was Peter's home that we see in verse 29 where Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So we're standing right there, right outside his home, and we're looking at the synagogue of Capernaum. And the city of Capernaum is in between. And we'll come to that uh, a little bit later as well. But what is interesting, and I'll tell you right up front, as we look uh, at this uh, synagogue, this is, this is not the synagogue that Jesus was in. We're going to show you the synagogue a little bit later where Jesus was in and where He went into uh, in this verse. And what is amazing is you read the Gospel of Mark, Mark, Mark tells us so much about what happened in Capernaum. He tells us about the home uh, uh, of Peter. He tells us about the centurion's uh, sick servant. He tells us about uh, Jesus healing his mother-in-law, the man that was lowered through the roof, you remember? That takes place in this town. And I'm going to show you the town. You're looking at it now. But uh, we're going to visit the synagogue uh, this morning. So again, it's amazing to see uh, the very area where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, preached. So again, as we see this, uh, would you listen uh, that uh, Capernaum became the home of Peter and Jesus? You say, well, how do we know that? Well, the Scripture tells us. Now, we know that Peter was from Bethsaida and Jesus was from Nazareth. But listen to what Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now we know according uh, to the scripture that Jesus preached uh, from the synagogue of Nazareth. And you know how that ended. They drove him out of the city and tried to kill him. So what did he do next? Listen to what the Bible tells us in uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now when Jesus has heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee, leaving Nazareth, for he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by uh, Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now, you remember that we shared with you that 70% of Jesus' ministry took place in Galilee. And as I was reading the last couple of weeks the Gospel of Mark, uh, I'm amazed at so much that took place in the city of Capernaum. So much of Jesus' healing. So many things that happened. And in fact, Jesus would leave Capernaum, leave Galilee, and He would go to different places in that area. And we'll see that as we study the Gospel of Mark. Then He would come back to Capernaum. Why? Because we believe, as the Scripture says, He dwelt there. That became His, his home where He lived for a time. And even as we see uh, a little bit later, that that's where Peter lived as well. We also see, and we'll come to that a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark, that was where another disciple lived. Capernaum was in a very major highway from the east to the west. And it was there at Capernaum that the tax collectors would collect their taxes as the people came through a main thoroughfare. And you remember there was another man who's mentioned in Mark chapter 2 and verse 14 that Jesus called to be another one of his disciples. So again, uh, Capernaum, uh, Capernaum is a very important town in the ministry of Jesus. There was the light. How did Matthew describe it? The light came to that city. But we'll see a little bit later as the light and the miracles and the ministry and we would call the second hometown of the Lord was there at Capernaum. Where light comes, there's responsibility. When light comes into your life, you're responsible for what you do with that light. 
And we'll see that Jesus a little bit later had something to say about this town called Capernaum because that was his secondary hometown. That's where many of his miracles and many of the things uh, were done in Jesus' ministry. And I would say in your life, when you hear the truth of the Word of God, you're responsible for what you do with that light. What are you going to do with it? Well, in this story, the Bible says Jesus went there straightway. On the Sabbath, He entered into the synagogue and taught. Now, this is an entrance to the synagogue that you could see from Peter's house just across the town. You could see it. Now, maybe you couldn't have seen it so well as the homes were completely built, of course, in Jesus' day. But this is, this is that synagogue. Here's a picture of, of Melanie and I standing in that synagogue uh, at the place. Uh, of course, a lot of the structures have been destroyed uh, that were there. But uh, again, it was just a, a blessing to, to stand there in the synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum. Now, I'm going to show you the actual synagogue uh, where Jesus went to, preached on a number of occasions. You're looking at it. Not the white stone. This, stone, this synagogue was built around the third century. It was built on top of the first century synagogue. Now, that's the way a lot of the buildings were in that day. As you maybe cannot see as well, maybe from the very back, but the synagogue that Jesus called in is the synagogue with the black basalt stone underneath this synagogue. You see the dark stone underneath? That's the first century synagogue. Well, on our way out, the uh, guide told us that. And I said, oh, he just took away all the joy of uh, walking through the synagogue. You know, I kept thinking. But uh, what you need to see is this is the actual synagogue, an uh, artist's uh, rendition of that first century. It was built on top of the other synagogue. I mean, the, this one that was destroyed, um, as it says here, uh, uh, Kapar Nahum, uh, Nahum uh, is the town that the Hebrews call it, but we call it uh, Capernaum. But let me share with you as Jesus went into this synagogue, very similar to the one built just like the one that was uh, underneath it in the third century. And here's the procedure when you went into a synagogue, here's the procedure by which they would have the service. Now we have an order of service here in our church. Uh, we have a Wednesday night order of service. We have a Sunday night order of service. And we have a Sunday morning order of service. It's in your bulletin. Well, when you went into a synagogue and you sat down, there was an order of service. And here's the way it was. It often started with prayer as the, the rabbi would pray. Then there would be a time of praise to the Lord and thanksgiving. And then... If a visiting rabbi was there in the synagogue, remember these synagogues were scattered out through the land of Israel, and if there was a visiting rabbi, uh, you would ask that rabbi to come and read the Scripture and comment about the Scripture, or what we would call maybe preach or give a devotion. So that was generally the way the order of service uh, went uh, in the synagogue. So here is Jesus comes into this synagogue in Capernaum. And what does the Bible say? Is that as he went into the, that synagogue, he most likely read the scripture and he taught them. He taught. Now again, we know according to the scriptures that Jesus went around all of that area preaching and teaching in the synagogues. We showed you the one at Magdala that uh, was a very elaborate, even more so than this synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus went in all these areas. Why, why did Jesus do that? That was where the people came to hear the Word of God. You see, you didn't have a Bible uh, in your lap when you went to the synagogue. The only Bible you had was the one that the priest or the rabbi would take out from the scrolls, lay it out on the Magdala stone, you remember, much like our pulpit, and he would read the Scripture. You didn't have a copy of the Word of God. 
So where would they hear the Word of God? They would go to the synagogue. What's the history of the synagogue? You remember when the temple was destroyed in 586 and God's people were taken back to Babylon? There was no temple. So they got together and they formed a, a place called the synagogue where they could get together and read the Bible and be taught the Scriptures and the Word of God. And of course we know the story that uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple and the wall and so forth. So these synagogues continued throughout the land of Israel. But listen to the power of Jesus' teaching. Now we know the place he went was there at Capernaum. And here is what probably the synagogue looked like. And let me show you uh, from the other synagogue. This was the one that was built on top of the other synagogue. It was very much like the one Jesus was in. And Jeremy is standing right where the podium would have been in the synagogue, much like this podium. And the rabbi would uh, read the scripture and then he would teach or comment upon that scripture. In fact, you can uh, read the gospel and see how that is exactly what Jesus did in Nazareth, in the synagogue. Right behind Jeremy, if you can see from the very back, Steve probably way back there, uh, you can see we sat upon those seats those cement or uh, whatever they are, uh, they're like cement, uh, steps. And that's where uh, the, the uh, people would sit and also uh, sitting places out uh, in front there aside. But we sat uh, there and our guide lectured to us about this particular synagogue. So imagine as this synagogue was much like the one uh, that Jesus was teaching in. But notice the power of his teaching. It says they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not the scribes. In other words, Jesus' teaching was different. There was something different about his preaching and his teaching. Well, you say, well, how can we know what he preached and taught? Because we have recorded messages through inspiration of the Scripture, some of the sermons that Jesus preached. In fact, we're studying in Sunday school uh, the Sermon on the Mount. This was one that Jesus preached. His first very public message as He spoke from the Mount of Beatitudes, it wasn't far from Capernaum. And there was thousands of people that came to hear Him teach and preach as they sat on the hillside and as Jesus preached to them. You want to know what Jesus preached? Again, He told them in Matthew 5 to repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he told them, unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll all likewise perish. Now that didn't go over too well to the religious crowd. This is early on in Jesus' ministry. In the Sermon on the Mount that we see in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, as Jesus preaches with authority and with power, as He tells them uh, to look to the Lord, look to the Word of God. And you know what? As He preached with authority. I like what John Phillips said. The message would be lavishly illustrated from everyday objects and events. It would be thoroughly documented by many Old Testament references or illusions. You see, uh, as Jesus taught the verse says he taught with authority. Now what does that mean? He taught with authority. Does it mean that he had a real bass voice and you know when he taught you know oh, that's he's teaching with authority. No that, that's not what it meant at all. The word authority according to Strong's means that he had power right, liberty jurisdiction strength. In other words when Jesus taught he, he took the word of God the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi and he rightly divided the word of truth and he taught with authority that he knew his subject. Recent days 
I've been listening to Doug Petrovich, who is an archaeologist and Egyptologist. He's been speaking on uh, Egypt. And uh, he was one of the authors that I quoted quite a bit in my doctrinal project about Egypt and the Bible. And uh, so he's lecturing on some of the very things that I used in my paper. And it was such a thrill to hear this man teach that he knew the subject of Egypt. He knew the history of Egypt. And he could take Egypt history and the Bible and weave them together. I think about men like Ken Ham, who when he speaks on creation, that he knows the Bible and he knows the Word of God and he takes uh, uh, creation and evolution, I mean, in uh, 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 the flood and all the things of the Bible and he brings them together and you think, here's a man that knows his subject. Here's a man that knows what he's talking about. You ever hear a good old preacher that takes the Word of God? Uh, one of my favorites for many years was Warren Wearsby. He was one of the first uh, that I took in my doctrinal program at Tennessee Temple. He was one of the first uh, uh, courses that I took, uh, preaching and teaching the New Testament. And we enjoy hearing him preach today on the radio. He died the very week that uh, I got my doctorate. But uh, when, when somebody that knows the Bible preaches, they speak with authority. And that was Jesus. And as Jesus spoke from the Word of God, He spoke with authority. And the Bible says they were astonished. In other words, the Pharisees, here they were uh, teaching and reading the Scriptures, but it, they said uh, it was totally different. In fact, in John seven forty six, this says, uh, they commented about Jesus, Never a man spake like this man. To realize that as Jesus spoke, he knew the authority of the Word of God. Again, uh, Good said this, meaning strictly to strike a person out of his senses by some strong feeling such as fear or wonder or even to enjoy. Talking about the word astonishment. In other words, when Jesus spoke, they were astonished at his power. Again, what did Jesus do? He went back to the Word of God. That's what we need this day in which we live. We need the power of the Word of God. That's what people need is God's Word. But as Jesus is preaching with the power of the Word of God, notice in our story the presence of Satan. And notice in verse 23, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now here, as I stop and thought about this verse, and I read some commentaries, they said, Satan was in the synagogue that day. When you stop and think, the devil came to church. This man was demon-possessed. In fact, he uses the plural in this verse when he says, let us alone. So this man was demon-possessed. The devil was at church in the synagogue. He heard Jesus as he taught and read the Scriptures that day. And he cried out to interrupt. Again, I think it was John Phillips that said, the devil had little, little fear from the usual synagogue service. I don't know if it was this man's first time to come or not. I don't know whether he had been other times, wasn't phased by what he heard and what was said, but that particular day when Jesus spoke with the power of the authority of the Word of God, oh, it pierced his heart and his life, and he didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. Isn't that like the devil? Isn't that like truth? What does truth do? Truth repels darkness. And those in darkness hate the light. 
And I think about what we've seen in recent days across our land is when the truth goes out, the life begins at conception. People hate the truth. When we tell them, oh yes, evolution is a lie, there is a God. People hate the truth. When we say that God made one man and one woman and you were born a man or a woman like the Bible says, people hate the truth. When we say that the Bible has the answers for all of life, people hate the truth. The devil hates the truth. And Jesus said in John, he's a liar and the father of it. Oh, but this Satan came to church that day. Someone said, sad, many churches are empty because the power of God is not present. There may be some scripture, but it's not expounded, taught, rightly divided. Paul said the true preaching of the word rebukes, reproves, and exhorts. It's sad to say many a Christian want to go to church and, and they want to feel good and want to feel something instead of feeling convicted about their sinful, ungodly lives and worldliness. We want the world to be at home in the church. But not in Jesus' day. The scriptures was read. What is interesting is I think about this sinner, this demon-possessed man was in the synagogue. Now don't you think that's strange? Why would a demon-possessed man go to where the scripture was read and taught? You'd think that would be the last place that he would want to go. But you know what I believe? I believe that even though Satan had control of this man, that I believe in his soul there was a crying out. They hear the truth. They hear the truth. Just like Saul, you remember? You remember how Saul stood there and held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen? But yet he heard the truth. You remember when God struck him down from his horse and he asked him, Why kickest thou against the pricks? In other words, Saul was under conviction. And sometimes when people get under conviction, they get mean. But, but this man came. And you know what that tells me? Sinners are welcome at church. You see, in the synagogue at that time, as we were there with our guide in Magdala, he was saying at the temple there was a court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, and then the Jews. Not everyone was necessarily welcome. They had a court and a place they could go. But at the synagogue, all were welcome. The children could come. The women could come. The men could come. And even a demon-possessed man could come and hear the Scripture. And I couldn't help but think about Mary Magdalene, you remember, that maybe one of those occasions, maybe in Capernaum or maybe in Magdala, her hometown, as Jesus was teaching, even though her life was a wreck, and even though uh, she was a sinful woman, that uh, as she came and, and there she could hear the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Oh, but the lies of the devil will never fulfill and satisfy. Isn't that like the devil? The lies of the world, the lies that Satan tells. He says, it's interesting the demons knew who Jesus was in verse 24. They said, What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Thou art come to destroy us. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now some say that the reference to Jesus being from Nazareth was a slight upon his character and his life and where he was from. But again, as the demon said, uh, why do you trouble us? In other words, uh, uh, as they said, let us alone. In other words, uh, uh, as they were disturbed about the presence of the Lord. But it's interesting that Jesus had defeated Satan into temptation. And now he enters into his territory to set the captives free. And here is this man was controlled by demons that Jesus had come to set people free. 
whether it be alcohol or drugs or immorality or lies or destruction. Jesus said, the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. You see, you're freed when you trust Christ as your Savior and follow Jesus Christ. You're free from the lies and the deception and the enslavement that sin brings. And isn't it like the devil that tell people, oh, alcohol's gonna, gonna bring you satisfaction, and it doesn't. Drugs and immorality, and it doesn't. And the woman at the well, as she went from one immoral relationship to another, and there was no satisfaction in her life, and Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. But if you partake of me and drink of me, oh, you'll never thirst. Oh, he feels a longing down in your soul, the song says. But notice these demons said, he's the Holy One of God. They knew who he was. They knew that he was God in the flesh. It's interesting. Would you look, if you would, in verse 24, the demon said, I know thee who thou art. Would you underscore the word know? It's not the general word in the Greek, gnosko. It's the word oida. And the word oida gives a stronger emphatic of knowledge that these demons knew without a doubt that Jesus was God in the flesh. And what a sad plight it is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they never recognized who Jesus was. But the demons knew it, but they didn't accept it. Again, one commentator said the holiness of Jesus burned into the demon's consciousness like a red hot iron. We know you're the Son of God. But notice the Prince of Peace. He speaks in verse 25. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Now it's interesting, the word hold thy peace. Again, Strong says in the Greek, it implies be muzzled. Be muzzled. Restrain thyself. And that's exactly what the demons did. Isn't it wonderful to know that God has power over the devil and God has power to give us victory in our lives? And Jesus said, come out, or it implies to get out or go away. And that's exactly what the demons did in verse 26. It says they uh, tore him and the unclean spirit tore him and he cried with a loud voice and he came out of him. Oh, to realize that Jesus is showing his power over this demon and to give victory in this man's life. But notice what happened in verse 27. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves saying, What thing is this? What's this new doctrine? For what authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits that they do obey him? And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Again, one commentator said he exposed the terrible dangers that impel, imperil mankind and revealed his own absolute lordship over all the situations and conditions of life. He had already defeated Satan personally in the wilderness and now he sowed havoc in his realm. What a blessed thought to know that you and I can go out into this world and we can knock on doors and we can tell boys and girls you can have victory. Yes, the Bible says there is a God regardless of what the world says. Yes, there is an accountability to that God. You are made in the image of God and God loves you and died on the cross. We can go out into the devil's domain whether it be in our colleges or whether it be in our schools or in our government that hates the truth. And the media and the liberals are going crazy now because we believe that life begins at conception and man's made in the image of God. 
what does the truth do? The truth sets people free. What do lies do? It enslaves people to sin and to immorality. Remember what Mark said back in verse 22? And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. I want to close with this story and I'm going to show you a picture a picture out of this book now it's not a very clear picture I grant that but this is Arlene Cornelius's new book that she has spent the last number of years writing and she sent me one here at the church and as you know Arlene Cornelius has been for many years a missionary there with her and her husband uh, the first went to Antigua and then they went to Grenada but she tells the story let me show you about this man here's what she says and I'll, I'll try to make it quick she said I was walking one day in the villa of Antigua and I walked by this man he was a strange looking man he looked a little fierce with his long dreadlocks in his hair she said I began to talk with him and here's what he said to me you should smoke the herb, he said. Smoke the herb? What do you mean by that? You see, he was talking about marijuana. You see, he was a Rastafarian, a Rastas as they were called. She said they belonged to a strange religious cult. They grew marijuana, made their own cigarettes, and smoked them. They say that that makes them have the spirit. She said, well, that wasn't the kind of spirit that I had and didn't want. Not only did they smoke marijuana, but they read the Bible. And they usually read the parts of the Bible that they liked and stayed away from the parts of the Bible they didn't like. And I'll not take time to tell you about all this Rastafarians and what they believed, but again, it was a cult. It was based on a man named Silesi who is revered as a returned Messiah of the Bible. He was God incarnate. It began in Jamaica in the 1930s. And many of the Rastafarians uh, looked upon him as the Messiah. And the Rast, Rast, uh, Rastas, as they were called, grew marijuana in the hidden places in the jungles. And she tells a story about her boys went out into the jungles one day and found this plant growing in a pot. So she put it on the porch. She didn't know one plant from another and began to water it. She said one of the locals came to her house one day and says, uh, Mama C, why do you have a marijuana plant on your porch? She said, what? And that's what it was. So they went to the authorities and the, the boys took the authorities out into the woods where these rasters were growing this marijuana because at that time it, it was illegal. But sure enough, as they begin to minister in that particular part of the world and give the gospel, again, the Rasferians had a hideout in the mountains of Antigua where they smoked their marijuana and the herb, as they called it, and worshipped Jah. That was what they called him. But what was interesting enough, some of these Rastas, as they were called, begin to hear the Word of God on the radio from the Caribbean Lighthouse. And as they begin to hear the Word of God, there was one man, and this is his name, his name was Jerome Martin, began to hear, along with a couple of his buddies, this gospel and the true Word of God, that men were sinners and that Jesus Christ came to this world to die for sinners and they needed to put their faith and trust in Him. And as they began to hear that truth, they began to listen to the radio. So they wrote a letter, and here's what the letter said, Dear Sirs, we are Rastafarians, and we want to know the truth. We've been listening to you on the radio lighthouse, and we want to know where we can find a good Christ-believing church where we can learn more about God. 
So they gave him the address of the church where they were going. It was Maranatha Baptist Church. And sure enough, she said, one Wednesday night, three fellows were waiting at the church when they showed up to church one Wednesday night. And Jerome was one of them. And guess what? Jerome heard the gospel. And he and his two buddies about Jesus Christ. He said when the invitation was given that evening, they wasted no time. All three of them went straight to the front of the church, knelt down at the altar, and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. The darkness was pierced in the truth of the Word of God. Arlene says, We watched these young men grow in the Lord for a couple of years and felt led of the Lord to invite two of them he said, with us to um, education to join our staff. And then lo and behold, Jerome Martin told us that the Lord had called him to preach. We suggested that he attend Baptist Bible College on the island of St. Vincent. He wanted to learn all that he could about the Lord. When he graduated from the Bible College, he returned to Antigua to serve the Lord. And Maranatha Baptist Church was now in need of a pastor. So guess who they called? Jerome. To be the pastor of their church. Isn't that a wonderful story of what the gospel can do? How the gospel can change a life? Who a man who's caught up in a cult and lies, serving jaws, smoking marijuana for Jesus, and how that when he heard the truth of the gospel, he accepted Christ. The darkness fled away, and the light of the glorious gospel of Christ went out over the radio. And you and I can be a part of that gospel, sharing the good news in Chillicothe and around the world and Jesus spoke that day in the synagogue in Capernaum and the truth of the word of God spoke to many that were listening and one was a demon possessed man yeah who came to church the devil came to church and heard the gospel and Jesus gave him the gospel would you bow with me in prayer That's what it's all about. The world hates the truth, the light. But Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He tells that in His Sermon on the Mount. And then He tells them, Ye are the light of the world. And how we need to be a light in a dark world. And you know what? Sometimes the world's going to hate us for giving the truth. The world may hate us for saying Jesus is the only way. Oh, but we must give them the truth. That's what sets men free. That's what set boys and girls free. That there is a God. And He loves you and He died on the cross for you. And we can share that truth. Father... Thank you for the power of the gospel to change lives. And I pray that you would help us to be a part of that gospel, sharing that wonderful truth. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 550 if you